to sin and it's called addiction. We have a lot of compulsive disorders with labels of all kinds of victims and we have alcoholics, we have workaholics, uh, compulsive gamers, control addicts, uh, we have shoplifters, domestic abusers, and yes, drug abusers and addicts. But there's a common denominator to all of these addiction victims and what they share, and that is a helpless slavery to self-destructive acts and compulsive negative thinking. So these isms are often labeled by clinicians as diseases that render victims unable to say no to temptations and all confess the same tension with their addiction. They love it and they hate it. These holics hate themselves for giving in to binges, drug addicts, love to live in torment of live in a torment of hell which they hate. Gamblers are driven by a demonic urge to spend the family's last dollar in gaming meccas. Workaholics sacrifice family and love for a pathological restlessness, but all wonder why they can't control their urges. The idea today of self-control, which is another term for temperance, you know, that went out of fashion a long time ago, didn't it? Self-control and temperance. Way back when the AMA declared addictions to be a disease. And almost overnight, these diseases became respectable. They were no longer moral failures. Now, they were no-fault diseases. But this popular philosophy is being seriously challenged today by thinkers. Some hold that, quote, people are using addictions as an excuse for wife abuse vehicular homicide, embezzlement, every crime you can think of. Addicts, are, these thinkers are saying, are deficient in certain values so that addiction is the result of wrong moral decisions. So advocates of the disease theory search for the root cause in a hidden biolog biological or maybe a hormonal deficiency in body chemistry and so they hope that drugs will cure the addictions without a moral change of character. But medical opinion is sharply divided about the lasting effectiveness of such drugs because they bypass the addict's exercise of moral choices which is obviously unrealistic. The question for us this morning is, where can we find long-term recovery from addictions? It's generally recognized to lie in the area of the mind, a study of the mind rather than through manipulating people's body chem chemistry. What cannot as yet be proven is the which comes first, the chicken or the egg. Do wrong mental attitudes go before the addiction or does some elusive chemical imbalance or hormonal problem cause the addiction? And so the mind and the body medicine has proved, provided evidence that wrong mental attitudes go before and actually cause or predispose to physical disease. Is it true that Mental attitudes, wrong mental attitudes, precede slavery to addictions. And if so, their correction is the only lasting solution to the problem. And here is where Christ's gospel may find a place in the picture. But we're kind of ahead of ourselves. In most cases, addictions follow long-cherished wrong habits of thinking. You know, you can go to therapists and they will try to get across to you certain ideas in your mind to correct wrong mental attitudes and they will charge you a lot of money for it and this therapy can go on for months and yes, even years. 
But Jesus Christ has a solution to these problems. He does. So let's meet the true issue head on. Your job is to believe the truth of John 3.16 that applies to you personally. That God so loved the world, he so loved you, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Your job is to reject the lie that God is somehow your enemy. Our fallen human condition is hatred against God. The solution to be reconciled to God by realizing how Christ was made to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you doubt God's personal individual love for you, the reason is that you don't yet see what his loving and his giving of himself entails for you. The Father did not simply lend his Son to you, but he gave Jesus to you. No taking him back again. He gave him to us completely and forever. And the death that Christ died for you on his cross was the sole anguish of hell. That kind of death. Christ went through the experience of feeling hopeless despair, facing the prospect that everything was against him, that even God had turned away from him. All through his life on earth, Christ had lived in the bright sunshine of his Father's acceptance. But on the cross, it was different. In deep reverence, we must say that on his cross, Christ experienced the most subterranean roots of our human despair and depression. And it was all, it was as though every cell of his being was on fire with that tortured sense of horrible failure, with not even a flicker of light at the end of his tunnel. That's when Jesus was made to be sin for us, who knew no sin. And with all of your heartaches and troubles, you have not known a millionth fraction of the agony that the Son of God felt in giving himself for you. So you can get on your knees with John 3.16 open before you. And you can tell the Lord Jesus, I don't know how to believe, but I choose to believe this promise. John 3.16. I'm not going to wait until I feel it. I choose now to trust that you love me personally like I am and that you died for me like I am and that you will heal me. And when you make this choice, you confess that you cannot solve your problem yourself, that you need a savior. Don't try to make any common vain promises to him. What he asks is that you believe his promise to you. You say amen to it. Your truest self-respect is rooted in that choice to believe this good news. If you pay a store $300 for a new coat, you do so because you believe that the coat is worth $300. If the Son of God gave himself for you, then what is your true worth? This wasn't a single event transaction when Jesus died on the cross. You have something continually going to you. It is the constant ministry of Christ as your divine counselor. We read in Hebrews 4.14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So let us come therefore boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So Jesus is a full-time therapist. Yes, he's on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks of a year, including holidays. Personally, I freely have to confess to you that I would come unglued if it were not for the fact that I have a divine psychiatrist like that. Amen. And the Apostle Paul felt the same way, for he said, to me to live is Christ. 
And so there is the high, the sense of peaceful well-being in Christ that addicts seek for vainly in their compulsions. He is near to every one of us through his Holy Spirit. And even though he has 8 billion patients on this earth, each one gets his full attention as if he or she were the only person on earth. So that's the reason for the therefore in the text that says, come boldly. So what practical help does the Holy Spirit give to the addict, the slave to sin? Here is how he goes to work in a very practical, effective level in Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. We read, the flesh, I, lust, desires against the spirit. And the spirit strives against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. So don't read this promise backwards, assuming that your big eye, your flesh is so strong with its evil compulsions that you cannot do the good things you would like to do because that is not what the text says. The Apostle Paul's point becomes clear to us in reading Galatians 5.16, the preceding verse where he says, if you go for a walk with the Holy Spirit, letting him hold you by the hand, then the apostle guarantees that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Yes, the flesh will continue to strive. The inner you will continue to try to motivate you to give in to that selfish indulgence, whatever it may be. From alcoholism to sharpaholicism. But the Holy Spirit's striving will be stronger than that of the flesh. And thus you will gain the complete victory. The truth of this is lodged in that phrase justification by faith. It's very practical. It's not some abstract concept or theology that we argue about in Sabbath school classes. The truth of justification by faith, which is victory over sin, is a very practical godliness. It is vitally involved in these victories, even over that breaking of the seventh commandment. Christ endured the bitter hell that adultery entails. And he endured it for every man and woman. Thus the sin of everyone's unfaithfulness was laid upon Jesus. For he was made to be sin for us. And thus forgiveness is already a fact. And justification by faith is the heart appreciation of that blessed fact of Jesus' forgiveness. And so this changes your heart. It changes my heart and teaches us to hate sin and henceforth say no to it. Amen. Justification is never the result of our taking the initiative. To think so is discouragement, for we are never sure that our initiative is good enough. It is due entirely to God's initiative. God has forgiven us our sin. He has already accepted us. He has died in Christ, every man's death. He has tasted that second death. Our part is to appreciate his initiative, the cost of our redemption to him. And that is faith. That is when faith works by agape love. Amen. So when you and I identify with Christ in this complete way, as Paul did, I am crucified with Christ. That self-loving I finally realizes the price that had to be paid for its unfaithful affair. So deep is the heart-wrenching agony that the penitent feels that addiction now becomes eternally abhorrent. And this is how true justification by faith is made manifest in obedience to all of the commandments of God, included in genuine forgiveness, justification by faith, is the recovery 
of a rock-solid experience of unshakable self-respect. And this makes temptation to unfaithfulness lose its charms. The Ten Commandments become ten promises to the one who believes that the Lord has brought you, dear heart, out of slavery to sin, which is Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And while we never think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, still we are to think, Paul says, soberly, as God hath dealt to every man a measure of faith. And such sober self-respect is calm, it is collected, it is assured, for it rests on the foundation of the cross. You believe that Christ gave himself for you, bought you with the price of his own blood. You at last know who you are. You are a child of God, and you know where you are going. You're going to sit with Christ on his throne. And there's not a trace of pride or vanity that can exist in this sober self-realization. But nonetheless, you find it impossible henceforth to yield to alluring temptation. And the motivation is the key to it all. Lurking fear constantly overshadows a false self-esteem that will nurture pride. It is a jamming of heaven's broadcast frequencies. Fear of losing family, the breaking up of your marriage, the alienation of your once beloved children, even fear of AIDS is powerless to hold an infatuated person from giving in to unfaithfulness and temptation. It is not, says Sister White, the fear of punishment or the hope of everlasting reward that leads the disciples of Christ to follow him. They behold the Savior's matchless love revealed throughout his pilgrimage on earth from the manger of Bethlehem to Calvary's cross and the sight of him attracts. It softens, it subdues the soul. There is a spin-off of Christian theology called Calvinism that has this idea that it is impossible for a sinful human being to overcome sin itself. It says that sin lies deeper than a conscience or even an unconscious choice. And therefore, everything you do or even think is already sin. This is the idea of Calvinism. This comes across in a practical living as a, a no-win, no-win situation. A unfaithful fa fantasy flirts across the mind and says this theological idea, you've already done it if the th thought flits across your mind. And so then human reasoning makes, makes the ne next step and adds, okay, I've already broken the seventh commandment because I've thought it. And since I must depend on Christ's obedience to substitute for me in the judgment, I might as well ask forgiveness for two sins as well as one sin and go ahead and do the deed of unfaithfulness. And that, folks, is a very cruel deception. Jesus never said that temptation itself is sin. Never. A passing thought is not unfaithfulness unless we cherish it. You have to invite those birds of temptation to make a nest in your head. What Jesus condemned is looking on a woman or a man in lust, which is to cherish and formulate the purpose, awaiting only the opportunity for consummating it. An evil thought resisted and denied does not develop into sin. Ellen White says in Testimonies, volume 5, 177, an impure thought tolerated, an unholy desire cherished, and the soul is contaminated, its integrity compromised. Every unholy thought must be instantly repelled. To your closet, followers of Christ, no man can be forced 
to transgress. His own consent must be first gained. The soul must purpose the sinful act before passion can dominate over reason or iniquity triumph over conscience. Temptation, however strong, is never an excuse for sin. So, what's so wrong with sin? Reasons, people. Can't one be forgiven after all anyhow? Well, yes, but the real issue here, folks, is the shame and the disgrace that we bring upon our Savior. That's the real issue. And if we, as Paul put it, crucify to ourselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, there comes a very real danger. We may feel at last, we may at last feel shut out of heaven, not by any arbitrary decree on the part of God, but by our own conviction of unfitness for its companionship. It is serious. And so the sanctuary message shifts our concerns away from our happiness, my happiness, my reward in heaven, to a genuine empathy with Christ in his closing work in this day of atonement. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? That was the cry of the heart when temptation came to Joseph. Joseph saw the cross and he made a choice for Jesus. Come what may, he would not drive those nails through the hands of his Savior. So have you battled with compulsive temptations? Then you know that we need someone to teach us how to say no, not only with the lips, but with the heart. Fear of the consequences of our addiction is not the motivation that works. That all-important motivation has to be the sense of the grace of God manifested in the one who gave himself to redeem us. And when you believe yourself to be purchased and redeemed by Christ's sacrifice, what is the sure result? It is not arrogant pride, but a healthy, realistic self-respect. And the one who redeemed you also created you. And by the way, he did a good job. He has equipped you with the capabilities that you need in order to realize your dreams. You put yourself in David's psalm that exalts, I waited patiently for the Lord's help. Then he listened to me and he heard my cry. He pulled me out of a dangerous pit, out of the deadly quicksand. He set me safely on a rock and made me secure. He taught me to sing a new song, a song of praise to our God. You cannot remain a helpless victim to addiction if you will believe this promise of the Lord. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Amen. Isaiah 41 verse 13. It's not I, it is Christ who confronts the problems. You become his representative, his ambassador or envoy. You act in his stead to demonstrate his victory against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness. These are the spiritual agencies behind all evil addictions, the rulers behind the drug lords and the liquor barons. Our Savior has not promised always to get us out of prison or to heal us of sickness. His beloved John the Baptist died in prison and Paul was beheaded in Rome. Your trials and sufferings cannot be in vain, for others are watching you and will be encouraged by your victory. You are an ambassador from a great nation that cannot lose his cool in a foreign crisis if he remembers the dignity and the honor of his nation and its confidence in him. And to all whom the Lord pulls out of that deadly quicksand of self-destructive addiction, 
Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. And so the cheering daylight to flood across the minds that live needlessly in darkness is Christ's victory. There is no addiction that is as strong a force to enslave you as was the compulsion that Christ had to resist as he knelt in Gethsemane. It was there that his whole soul cried out for deliverance from the cross experience that awaited him. He did not want to go to the cross. That was the temptation. As the addict screams for relief, or any addict feels the undertow that sweeps him off of his feet, so Christ felt the tugging compulsion to turn away from his cross experience. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Can you imagine the quintessential multiplication of all of the human horrors? And you then come short of appreciating what that meant to him. It wasn't the mere dying that so agonized Jesus. The thought of it, death, would have been a very sweet release for him. The sooner the better. It was the cumulative corporate load of the world's guilt more than the total pain of world's wars and all of our human agonies combined. It was a yawning chasm of darkness stretched before him into eternity. The horror of eternal, ultimate God-forsakenness. That's how he was made to be sin for us. But he caught himself as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he added these words, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He chose to say no to that compulsive temptation, even though it took sweating blood to make the choice. And perhaps the temptation and compulsion were even worse as he hung on his cross, apparently indeed forsaken by God, reviled by human beings. At any moment he could have called the heavenly taxi to take him back where he came from and to leave the world in its well-deserved fate. He could have cried out, I can't stand it anymore, Father. Get me down off from this cross. Let the world perish. I only want out. Sin addict, whoever you are, look at Jesus on the cross, will you? And watch him and then wonder and appreciate. And then came that offer from the well-meaning Roman soldiers perhaps prompted by those compassionate Jewish women. Here's a drug to deaden your consciousness, to let you drift off into the relief of oblivion. No addict ever felt a greater compulsion as Jesus did to take that drug so he could just drift off in unconsciousness. But when he had tasted it, we read, he did not drink. He did not drink. Amen. There were two thieves that were crucified with him. One died in a swirl of bitter, hateful cursing. The other died as the most happy man who ever lived. For he had heard the Savior promise him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Now that believing thief has something to tell you and me this morning. Our addictions are cured when we are crucified with Christ. Amen.